Our text is from the Old Testament reading, Exodus chapter 3, in Jesus' name, amen. Our Old Testament reading today is a relatively familiar account, God's call of Moses to lead God's people out of Egypt, to set God's people free from oppression. And uh, you may have the images of the uh, Ten Commandments movie in your mind <laughs> at times, uh, at least, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the images of Moses in the burning bush kind of stick in my mind from that. Moses had been a prince of Egypt his first 40 years. Then Moses committed a murder and was a runaway. And now Moses has been shepherding his father-in-law's flocks for 40 years. Quite a different lifestyle from being a prince of Egypt. God, God's appearance to Moses that day must have been a surprise to him. He wasn't expecting it. God's appearance was an attention getter. A bush that's burning but doesn't burn up. It marks the appearance of the angel of the Lord, or more literally, we might translate the messenger, that's what angel means, the messenger of Yahweh. When Moses decided to check out this strange sight, we read that Yahweh saw and God called. So from verse two and now in verse four, we have the names, the angel of Yahweh or messenger of Yahweh, we have the name Yahweh all by itself, and we have the name God. All three names basically used interchangeably in these verses. God calls Moses' name twice. That's kind of a thing that was, was common in that culture in terms of announcing or calling out to somebody. Dr. David Adams says that Moses' response, which is sort of translated most places as, here I am, probably was the equivalent of us saying, what? <laughs> or, huh? Moses wasn't expecting a voice, was he? He wanted to see what was going on with the burning bush. God calls out then a warning. Don't come near. Take off your shoes. This is holy ground. And then he says, I am the God of your father, Singular, which is different than the way it's normally used in the Old Testament, God of your fathers, meaning all of Israel, here probably referencing Moses' own father being a follower of this true God. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. To which Moses responds by hiding his face because he's afraid when he realizes he's in the presence of holy God. God declares his presence among his people next. He says, I have seen their oppression. I have heard their outcry. I know their pains. All of these indicate that God is not a God afar off. He is with his people. And you probably have heard before that the word for know in Hebrew is much more than just knowledge. It means intimately involved with. It's the same word used in Genesis when Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bore sons. Intimate involvement is what no means in the Old Testament. And here it means God is with his people intimately. It is intensified by what he says in verse 8. And I've come down to deliver it, or him, a reference to Israel, from the hand of Egypt, and cause it to go up from that land to a land good and broad, a land flowing with milk and honey, kind of like the hymn we were just singing a bit ago. Dr. Paul Robbie of Concordia Seminary St. Louis calls this incarnational language, meaning God is coming down among them. And then God partially repeats what he has just said in a reverse order. The outcry has come to him, and I hear, means what it means, and I have seen the oppression. In verse 10, we get to the point of this appearance to Moses. Now come, I'm sending you, 
to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people out of Egypt. This is the purpose of God's appearance, to deliver his people from oppression. And Moses' response this time, well, with his knowledge of his people's slavery, you'd think he would jump for joy. After all, he's got family back there in the midst of that yet. But instead we hear, who am I to go to Pharaoh and bring the people out? What was Moses thinking? Was he worried about being a fugitive with a murder charge still hanging over his head? Perhaps. Was he worried about being out of the habit of talking like a prince in royal courts because he's been around sheep for 40 years? Perhaps. He does bring up his speaking problem again in chapter 4. Was he simply worried that anyone demanding freedom for the slaves of Egypt would be laughed at and probably made a slave himself? Perhaps. We don't know all of what was going on in Moses' mind and heart, all of the fear that was there, but there was a lot to be afraid of. The answer to all of that, to all that was on Moses' mind, comes in God's answer. I am with you, or I will be with you. God's presence changes everything, overcomes all of the myriad troubles that Moses foresees. God will be with him. And God gives him a promise, a sign that will be fulfilled in the future. He says, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, notice not if, when, when you bring the people out of Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. Now Moses probably would have preferred a sign in the presence, a miracle right now. Although when you stop to think about it, that burning bush that didn't burn up and the appearance of God himself was a miracle right before Moses' eyes. But sometimes what's right in front of our eyes we miss, don't we? Instead, God gives him a future assurance, the assurance that Moses will survive all the confrontations in Egypt and Moses will lead the people out and return to this place and worship God in this place. God has answered Moses' question about going before Pharaoh, but now Moses comes up with another question. If I go to the Israelites, if, and if they and, and say, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And if they ask me, what's his name, what shall I say to them? Moses is really asking for more than a name. He's asking about an identity. And God answers, I am who I am. Or more literally, I will be what I will be. That's God's identity. He's not merely one who exists, eternal, although he is that. He is the one who is always present, always near, always with his people, even when they forget that he's near. God goes on. The following you shall say to the Israelites, I am, or more literally, I will be, has sent me to you. I will be as future tense, and that's the actual tense that's used here, although most English translations go with I am. There's nothing and no time in the future when God will be absent from them, always with them. I will be has sent me to you. And God says it one more time. You shall say to the Israelites, now he uses the shortened form, the name Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. He's the same past, present, and future. The God always 
present with his people. I wonder how often we operate with attitudes and questions similar to Moses. Dear God, who am I to do the things you call me to do? I'm afraid of the consequences. I don't have the ability. What will other people think of me when I try to live according to God's commandments? If I try to talk with other people about God and His promises for their life, what will I say? What will they say? I don't know about you, but I find myself in those attitudes pretty often. When we live in these attitudes and questions, we're definitely lacking faith, or at the very least living in weak faith, aren't we? But to our lack or our weakness, God's answer is the same as to Moses. I will be with you. I will be what I will be. God's name as revealed to Moses is all of this. It's a look back, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and that is a reminder that all the things that he's done to keep his promises in the past, that he has always been with his people. God's name as revealed to Moses is a present reminder that he's never far off. He's always with us now. God's name as revealed to Moses is also always a look ahead, a reminder that his promises will yet be fulfilled just as they have been in the past and the present. God's name is a response to Moses' objections and our objections that we cannot be who he calls us to be. The Almighty Creator is able to enable us to be who he calls us to be. The main point of this account is God's response to the oppression of his people. During the life of Moses, that meant God was responding to the slavery that Egypt imposed upon the Israelites. That would then lead to God's fulfillment of giving Israel the promised land. And that would lead eventually to a promised birth in Bethlehem and a promised death on a cross, and a promised resurrection from a tomb outside of Jerusalem. For all of history and for all of mankind, God has been and continues to respond to the oppression that sin holds over all people. The one who said, I will be what I will be, always shows himself to be a deliverer. Yahweh is identified in terms of what he does. In the messenger of Yahweh, that angel, he, which was we understand to be Christ showing himself in the Old Testament, he frequently delivered his people in the Old Testament time and time again. In Yeshua, or Jesus as we call him, he revealed himself as the one and only ultimate deliverer, the redeemer, the savior of the whole world. He who said, I am with you always, is present with us to deliver us from the devil, the sinful world, and our own sinful nature, our sinful flesh. Those are our oppressors. He is present with us through his word so that we can hear all that He has done for us in living and dying on the cross and rising from the tomb. He is present with us through His water that raises us from spiritual death and gives us rebirth in spiritual life. He's present with us through His Word joined to bread and wine that brings us also to His true body and blood to continually forgive our sin and strengthen us in this new life until he comes again. When we start to question who am I to do what it is that God calls me to do, God says, I am with you. I will be with you always. I will be what I will be. And what he will be 
is our deliverer who never leaves us alone. Amen.